All right. Cool beans. Welcome, 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 everybody. Welcome to the midweek fundamental and technical analysis. Um, before I jump into it, let me give a quick disclaimer. This is not financial advice. Anything that I share during this analysis is for educational purposes only. I repeat, this is not financial advice. Anything that I share during this analysis is for educational purposes only. Cool beans, cool beans. Okay. Looking back at the beginning of the week analysis, I told you guys that I was bearish DXY this week, right? Um, told you guys that I want to see price um reach for these weekly PDRA levels to the downside, right? So um, as of right now, I'm just watching the dollar, uh, looking for it to give us an aggressive downward candle below these lower PD array levels that I want to see it breaking close below. Uh, up until then, it's just a matter of um, price and time, or uh, time and price, should I say. So, uh, yeah, still basically on the same side of the market that I was from the beginning of the week and still expecting to see the dollar sell off to close out the trading week. Cool beans, cool beans. Looking at uh, Euro USD, um, I see that we're um, still pushing up, which is good. I wanted to see price respect these monthly PDO rate levels that we uh, ran up to here last Thursday, right? And gave us um, three down days from Friday to uh, yesterday, and today was an up day. Um, so with that being said, and us being back above this monthly PD array level, I like to see Euro USD continue to extend to the upside to uh, run up into these weekly PD arrays to the upside. Who beans? Who beans? Same thing with uh, GBP USD. I like to see us continue to run up to the upside up into this daily fair value gap that we see here, right? First running that, retesting the lower level of that fair value gap and then consequently close. Who cool beans? Who cool beans? Remember that we are up. Two hundred and thirty something pips off the initial level. Um, same thing with NZD USD. I want to see us continue to extend higher, with this being the overall target, the monthly buy side liquidity. So, I like to see us around for about two hundred something more pips for NZD USD. Love to see us get above these PD arrays, right? If I did trade in, if I did trade in the USD, I would be looking to take my loans off of this level once we broke above it and closed above it. Who beans? Who beans? Uh, looking at uh, futures, and this is a reminder if you're on the call or if you listen to this later on tonight on YouTube or whatnot, you should be rolling over your futures contracts now, meaning you should no longer be trading the March contract. Look at my mouse. Look at my mouse. You should no longer be trading the March contract. You should be trading the June contract. And that contract is ESM. ESM for ES, right? And NQM for NQ. So with that being said, um, I told you guys that I wanted to see uh, futures pushing to the upside this week. I wanted to see us uh, push back up into Friday's premium levels. You see ES just blew through Friday's premium levels. I done deleted the levels, but you should be able to measure it somewhat with your eye. So we blew through it. Now I would like to see us, I would like to see us pull back down into the uh PD arrays. I it looks like um ES is leading right now, leading NQ. Um, because if I look at NQ, um yeah, NQ didn't blow through 
Friday's premium levels like it did, like ES did. And as you can see now, ES is higher than EQ. Um, so hmm, the way this um aggressive candle closed yesterday, um uh, I would like to see us pull back down into the PD array, right? That's the only way I would take a buy off of ES, right? <laughs> and I'm currently in a buy for EQ, but um I um think that with the way this candle was so aggressive yesterday, NQ may just run this uh weekly buy side liquidity from last Friday's high, right? Before we actually come down and retest. It don't matter to me regardless because I'm not gonna chase a buy. The only way I'm, I would buy ES is if it came back down and gave me an entry off of one of these uh daily. PD array level, right? Other than that, I'll be waiting for us to run uh, this buy side liquidity and then start to look for some smart money reversal reversals or um, 2022 models to set up to then target these same daily PD array level. Who being, well, this sell side liquidity first, right? That would be TP1 and then these levels and so forth and so forth. And uh, with uh, NQ, I would like to see NQ um, re um, retest today's PD array levels. Right? I need to. Uh, I haven't threw them on there yet. These are the PD array. These PD array levels come from Friday's price range. Um, but yeah, I want to see price come back up into today's premium price level and see how I react to those levels. I would like to see it um, respect those levels because I am um, bearish futures, right, overall, because we've been training up hard since October. So I do want to see some kind of correction, maybe down into this imbalance right here. Right on the daily time frame, and then see if it finds support there and continue higher, or if we break below and continue lower. So that's what I'm expecting out of the market going forward for the rest of the week. That will conclude the midweek technical analysis. At this time, I'll pass it over to Carmen so she can give us the midweek fundamental. It's all yours, Carmen. Cool. Hey, everybody. So I made a list of topics to talk about tonight. Um, but before I get started, it's actually things that are on the top of the list. So first of all, um, make sure that as we go into <clears throat> the rest of this year, that you find one trade setup and you stick with that trade setup. Um, I say that because um, so many times we get so much information and right now people don't need more information. They just need to actually execute on what they already know. Um, so don't fall prey to feeling like you need to know more um, trade styles. You need to learn more setups. If you trade what you have, then I promise you, if you're consistent with that for at least four to six months and you're good, um, with just that trade setup, then you'll actually start to see um, profitability there. Um, so moving on, um, the next topic I had is the State of the Union address. Um, so in my opinion, I know opinions may differ, but in my opinion, the State of the Union address was... Um, uh, it was a lot of um, promises, first of all, but it was also um, the things that I heard Biden say 
to me equated to money. Um, so anytime I'm listening to a president and I'm or a leader, it doesn't even matter who, but when I'm listening to a leader speak and I'm listening um, and I'm listening to them talk about what they want to do, what they're thinking about doing, what they feel is right for the people. If the things that they say consist of spending a lot of money or giving away a lot of money, that's a red flag for me because you can't anticipate that the economy is going to stay the way that it is or get better if we continue heavy money spending or giving. Um, we've given a lot of money overseas. Um, we've not only in just financials, but we've sent supplies and aid that still counts because those things have to be bought. Um, but there were topics consisting of student loans, um, housing. So there was a portion um, it was towards the middle, either like right at about half to three quarters of the way through the speech where Biden is talking about housing incentives and these housing incentives were going to be anywhere from like 500 to a thousand dollars per month for all citizens for a certain period of time. Now, granted, that sounds amazing. It sounds really, really good. But when you really start to think about the fact that I'm, I'm going to put this into perspective for you. Um, actually, let me share my screen. Uh, Mr. Levels, can I share my screen? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I'm just going to share my screen. We're going to pull it up. We're just going to look at it like right now. Um in real time can never remember the website but it's typically the first one that you come to if you go to the u.s uh if you type in u.s debt clock all right so um this is the running national debt um so you don't have to do the math and i don't even know if it's actually on here anymore it used to be but every 120 days or so. So about every like four months, we add a trillion dollars in debt. So every year we're adding about three trillion dollars in debt. That's not that's uh I was gonna say natural spending, but that's just spending that we have to do. That's spending we have to do for to cover the budget to cover um, all the social programs, to cover aid that we give, to cover all of that. Um, money that needs to be set aside for um, the FDIC, which is a part of the treasury, because now that is actually a thing that's being factored into the budget. A lot of people don't understand how the FDIC works. I will say this, keep it short. When a bank gets taken over by the FDIC, that money has to come from the treasury. The treasury has to get that money from their own special pot that gets set aside by the government. So yes, you, the taxpayer. Um, yeah, that's where that money comes from. Um, and not even so much taxes really, because I mean, if we think about it, Looking at this, when you think about tax revenue that's coming in, yes, we're getting a lot of tax revenue, but it's still not going anywhere to help cover debt. Um, so those social programs, um, or I'll just keep it on the debt clock until I'm ready to go to the Forex Factory calendar. I'm just going to continue to talk about the State of the Union for a few more minutes. Um, but that spending... Um, on top of the spending that was talked about for student loans, as I just mentioned, um, all of that spending goes, it has to come from somewhere. That money gets essentially printed. It gets created into existence. It gets given to the people. And the thought process is the same thought process that happens every other time that money is given out. The last time it backfired, 
And that's the reason why rates are so high right now. Anytime you've given out or money's been given out. So if we look back to Bush's administration, when we look back to the Obama administration, like when you start to look at the money that's been given out, the thought process is we are going to give the citizens this money. That money is then going to be spent by the citizens. It's going to come back into the economy. It's going to help the economy grow. We're going to get the growth we need. We're going to contract with these business businesses. We're going to pull that money back out of the businesses and kind of um, taper down the money supply. Well, with COVID, that is not how it worked. People took that money and they saved it. The Fed can keep track of how much money people have in their accounts. That money was saved. So um, to say that we're going to take this money and we're now going to try to give it back to the people so that in the form of housing incentives or whatever you may say, that money that people are are saving on the back end, are they really going to spend it in the economy with so much uncertainty? Um, so that's that. Um, you guys know who, let me see. Um, yeah, most of you on here, you guys know how I feel about guns. Um, gun control, that that came up. I just rolled my eyes. Um, at this point in time, listen, um, do what you want. But um, when you start hearing things like that, you start to know which industries to start pivoting and looking towards what which things to start paying attention to. Um, in my opinion, this is just another opinion of mine. I feel that um, speaking about gun regulation is it's important. I get it. But at the same time, um, I had to explain it to someone like shoes. Guns are like shoes. There's one for every occasion. Um, there's one that fits a style. And um, it's like people say, why do you need so many? Well, why do you need so many pairs of shoes? Um, and that's just how I think about it. Um, shoes protect your feet. A gun protects my life. <laughs> um, I, they're synonymous in my mind. Um, some people might not think about them that way. I do, but should Biden get another chance to try again? Um, <laughs> I will say definitely still, um, your gun manufacturers are going to see a slight pop in price. Um, they do every time a Democrat comes into office because that fear gets put into the minds of people that, hey, your gun could potentially be um, the last model that's made. It could be that um, we're not allowed to make that magazine anymore, that style of gun anymore. Um, not so much that you won't be able to possess it, but um, you might now have to have a tax stamp for it, which, you know, if you ever had to go through that process, um, for some people, it's a little lengthy. It's not quite as bad now. I think it's only like a few months to get a tax stamp for an item. Um, so anyway, um, so I would say steel, um, companies that manufacture steel, aluminum, um, make guns, make bullets, um, government contractors. And I say government contractors because those companies also tend to see a boom because then the thought process is if we're taking guns away from people, we have to protect people. So you now have to um, renew, so to say, or upgrade weapons that the military has for your National Guard, so on and so forth. So that kind of trickles all across the landscape for weapons. <clears throat> um, I also heard a couple of things in there, you know, about, um, you know, diversity, inclusion. Um, I'm not really going to talk heavily on that, but my thought process is um, for the current landscape that we're in, people should be given or people should have a job or whatever it is based on their ability to do it, um, not because of 
not because they fit into a box. Um, I'll just say that. I'll just leave it there. Um, but aside from those serious notes, I'm just going to say this. And I am kind of joking when I say this, but I am serious at the same time. Um, I really don't want Biden to be president again. I was listening to his speech and I was listening to his speech and I was listening to him get words out. And I've heard him speak before and I know how people in other places feel about it. And I know how other uh, people not just citizens, but like leaders in other places around the world feel about Biden. And I'm like, they just, they laugh. And it's it's not a good feeling. Um, anyway, so um, I'm just going to leave that at that um, for right now. We'll come back and hit on more points about the um, State of the Union address because as we talk about rates, as we go into the summer, a lot of those points are going to start coming up again just because some of the things that he brought up kind of renew again, like Social Security issues and that sort of thing. So um, we will be talking about that a little bit more. Um, another thing that's important, um, it's actually a little bit more pressing because it's going to affect everybody on the call is the settlements. So starting now between now and the end of may we have a lot of financial things shaping up um that are going to directly and indirectly affect markets so clearing houses um there is going to be a pretty much a new system for clearing houses clearing orders amongst each other, kind of like, um, it's almost going to be like a merger, if you want to think of it that way, of the systems. So clearing houses, working with each other, clearing orders, um, not just uh, domestically, but internationally. So right now, just to kind of keep it short, if the U.S. wants to trade with Europe, there's a middleman. Well, now the U.S. has a system set up in place so that Europe can essentially trade directly to. Um, it's almost like a merger, like I said, of the clearinghouse system. Um, so we have that. We have the World Bank um, doing their consolidations globally to help streamline, as they say, the global mobile and financial transfer system. Um, while those are important, I think the one that is the most pressing for everybody on the call is the settlement system. So that one happens at the end of May. And um, to me, um, that one's going to be the most pressing because that one affects the settlement time for trades and it affects liquidity. So um, Whereas, you know, we talked about the clearing houses before we talked about the settlement time for clearing houses and why trading at midnight, three o'clock in the morning, seven o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock in the morning were so pivotal and why the Fed news always seems to come out at eight, eight thirty in the morning. And that's because of that last settlement time um, that kind of carries over um, from London to the beginning of New York session. Anyway, um, T1, T plus one settlement times means that if you put your money in today, you're going to be able to trade with it tomorrow. Some place, some um, firms, some places where you can go to get investment accounts already kind of function on this principle where if you say you're going to make a deposit, but it's more of like a loan system. Um, but if you deposit money today, and it's before their um, their last hour to clear money. Um, if you put the money in, they'll credit that deposit to your account before it actually hits your account and you can trade with it. If you don't put that money in, 
they'll liquidate your account and then whatever you owe, if something went into the negative, then you owe that money to them. It kind of operates on the same system, but um, slightly different because whenever you actually see the money clear on your investment account, that's the part that's going to be affected. So you might be wondering like, well, how does that affect, um, how will that affect my trading? How will that affect um, liquidity? So um, essentially it's going to shorten up the amount of time that <laughs> that firms have to actually have the money in place. And I'm laughing because you would think a bank a hedge fund, whatever, trading billions of dollars would have that money readily available if they're getting ready to place this trade. No, they don't. So now, if you look, there are a lot of European firms and agencies that are now trying to station themselves here in the U.S. to avoid slippage. And it, it would be a horrible level of slippage because at the hour here that settlement happens, it's midnight in Europe. So they have to have someone here to be able to settle immediately and be ready to go. Otherwise, it will be a huge problem. And that liquidity time is 5 p.m. Like that, the technical range for it is 4 p.m. right at the end of New York. Um, right when the stock exchange closes, technically up until the end of after trading hours, technically is the settlement range of time that you have because after that last 30, sorry, 30 minutes after, um, after trading hours is the settlement time. So that's when you're technically in New York supposed to have everything settled. Um, but that's not how it always works. And so five o'clock, five o'clock is going to be the settlement time because that is going to be midnight London time, which is their settlement time. Um, so anyway, that's that. Um, T1 settlements, I honestly feel like if everyone took a pause the last week in May to just really understand how the liquidity flow is going to change um that would be amazing um just because i don't want anybody to miss out or anybody to feel like the markets are getting away from them um you might not have to adjust a whole lot but just in the spirit of knowing that things could possibly change going into technically what would be like asian session um, just make sure you kind of pause, you make sure everybody's on the same page. The European agencies have gotten their stuff together. The New York agencies have gotten their stuff together and in place, um, for the settlement time. Hopefully they have, um, they've had enough time and enough warning to get everything in place. So, um, I'll leave that there. Um, The last thing I'm going to say, and then um, I'll probably record the rest is because the rest is just the Forex factory calendar is um, Bitcoin. If you haven't been following Bitcoin um, and just like really charting it, looking at the differences between highs, lows, having times to the next having time, having time to the time it dropped, what the percentage was, like all of those things. I really encourage you to go and do those things because I saw, uh, it was actually a couple of weeks ago, Bitcoin is moving um, very institutional-like now. Um, not to say that Bitcoin doesn't have its level of volatility um, that it had before, because it does. Um, however, if you start to look at the moves, it just moves a lot different. Um, the levels that it goes back to, its behavior is starting to change. It's almost like a married person now. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, 
So I would just say, um, if you haven't, please go through and pay attention to cryptos, especially Bitcoin. Look at that chart, kind of go through, mark it up, and um, get your own analysis and understanding of it. And I'm going to leave it at that for now. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Levels. Thank you guys for listening. And I will, um, like I said, record the rest of it because it's just the Forex Factory calendar. Cool beans, cool beans. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude the midweek fundamental and technical analysis. As always, if these analyses add any value to your life, Please feel free to like, share, and most of all, subscribe on YouTube. It really helps out a lot. Um, I appreciate you guys coming out tonight, tuning in to get this knowledge and empower yourselves. Let your family and friends know you love them while they're still here, please. And as always, peace and love, everybody. You know. <laughs>